Welcome to the practice tonight. My name is Jill Davey and uh, gl glad for the folks that have dropped in here to the Zoom group. It's really lovely to see faces and beings. And um, for those that are unseen or following this practice after, um, I hope you feel a sense of being included and, and being seen. So tonight is a little bit of a kind of continuing the theme that we have been in these last five weeks. We've been doing the what was called the five aggregates, which is uh, in some ways it's a concept, but it, I find it really um, I find it a really helpful way to practice in as a formal practice, but also in daily life, just to have a, this kind of template or system to see where I'm getting hooked in creating me, in creating a story about myself. And uh, so this is an insight that the Buddha had um, around how we create a sense of self that is seen as being permanent, continuous, separate, solid self. And, and his amazing insight to see how that keeps arising and rising, how these elements come together to create this when we don't see clearly um this sense of permanence and separateness and self but and what's really interesting to me is that even when we see this so even if we practice with this or really study this or are on a longer retreat and can start to discern when this, how this is occurring, even when we have these, we've either heard, you know, these three ways of wisdom, hearing, hearing this teaching and then reflecting on the teaching or, and then having a direct experience of it where we can actually see the, these different elements directly know they're arising so even when we see how this we'll just say in short form these five aggregates come about even when we can see their illusory nature their conditioned impermanent unreliable effervescent really um, nature of these parts, we still continue to fall under their spell. So even when we kind of know what's happening and we have an understanding and even a, a direct experience of it, we can we still pretty constantly can very easily fall under the illusion of it or the delusion of it. Um, and we, so it's curious as to wh why does that, how does that happen? <laughs> how does that keep happening that we keep being, hmm, it, it's, it's like a, that, the magician's, uh, trick. We keep being swayed by the spell of not seeing clearly and um so uh in this um wonderful book uh called emptiness um a practical guide to, for meditators i'm not sure if that shows up backwards for you hopefully not oh good thanks uh so this is by guy armstrong and so he he is um exploring this question like even when we have some understanding of these five aggregates or this this way of becoming 
how we still fall under this this spell of it and he's looking at why 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 does this keep happening and uh he looks at two sources in particular and one is thoughts the whole system of thinking and how it takes over and the, the other is clinging so i want to talk particularly tonight about thinking um we can see this when we meditate, no matter where we are on a meditation practice or journey path. When we meditate, we choose an object for to rest the attention on and to return the attention to when attention moves away. So there's many, many objects for meditation. Uh, walking meditation, the sensations of the feet, it could be breath as an anchor, could be sounds, uh, could be sensations in the body. Um, I mean, I won't try to list them all, but just to point out that there can be many anchors and there can also just be kind of an open awareness, which seems like many anchors but it, it isn't it's like the anchor is is awareness itself and then just watching the different sense doors moving through so when we meditate we choose an object to direct our attention to and anybody that's tried meditation or is practicing meditation has experienced how quickly and how repeatedly our attention is captured by the stream of thoughts, the wonderful delights, the conjurings, the embellishments, the mental proliferations um, that are quite constant unless we've, we're really have trained the mind and or have slowed down enough on a longer retreat, et cetera. Um, and so this, how quickly, easily, and repeatedly we are captured by the stream of thoughts is something we're going to explore tonight. And in this book uh, that I just referenced by Guy Armstrong, I'll put the link for that down below in the YouTube recording. Uh, Guy says this about paying attention to thoughts. When our attention is not in the present moment, where does it go? We observe that it gets diverted into all kinds of thoughts that apparently are more interesting than a breath or a sensation, thoughts of past or future, work or family, self-image or fantasy. These thoughts do not occur in a clear, linear or logical pattern. They are chaotic and jumbled, leaping wildly from one topic to the next, sometimes accompanied by great swings of emotion. We might enjoy an image of lazing on a tropical beach in one moment and in the next be gripped by anxiety about a presentation at work. These are strong, there are strong forces at work in the mind that are not controlled by our conscious intention. And uh, <clears throat> he um, has a, a reference to um, a study that I, I looked up, um, which is just so, so amazing to me. So this, um, who is a social psychologist, Timothy Wilson, uh, conducted this study at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville with colleagues, and they recruited hundreds, hundreds of students and community members to participate in this study. Um, and they were, they, uh, it was to take part in thinking periods. <laughs> and they asked individuals, they, they put them in sparsely furnished rooms and ask them to set aside their distractions of course no cell phones and to put down their pens and other other 
personal belongings. And um, then they were given one of two tests that lasted between six and 15 minutes. It's not very long, six to 15 minutes. Some of the group were told to think about whatever they wanted in that period of time. And the other group had several prompts they could choose from, like to think about going out for dinner at a restaurant or to think about some sporting event, I think it was playing a sport. And, you know, so they could kind of have a theme that they could muse over. And then uh, they asked people to rate their experience afterwards on a scale of one to nine, nine being the most enjoyable on that scale. Um, and in both the free thinking group and in the planned thinking group, the ones that had a theme to think about, they were both about half the group, 50% of the people um, did not like the experience. And they rated, so they rated their enjoyment like lower, 50% and lower um, uh, on that scale. And, and um, generally a high, the group had a high rating of boredom. And uh, so then they thought, well, maybe it's, you know, because this artificial environment, let's let them do it at home in their own environment. So the, the same the same study and people could practice this at home for periods of time and then rate it. And it was similar results. So then they took the ex experiment a step further, <laughs> which is so great. Who gets these ideas? So. The step further, for 15 minutes, the team left participants alone in a lab room in which they could push a button to shock themselves if they wanted to. So completely voluntary, here's a button. You can give yourself a shock if you want. And even though beforehand, all the participants had previously stated that they would pay money to avoid being shocked, all of them said they would pay to avoid being shocked. But when they were in there, 67% of the men and 25% of the women chose to inflict themselves with an electric shock rather than just sit there quietly and think. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Oh, wow. That's just so, that just says so much. And uh, when I've mentioned this to other people, they're like, yeah, I get that. I would well, I'd probably take the shock sometimes when I'm alone with my thoughts, you know, and in the wee hours of the night. Where I just want to shock myself out of these grooves of thoughts or this like wildly swinging thoughts, like the way um, Guy Armstrong described there in that paragraph, you know, either from boredom or just just the chaotic nature, the, the random nature of so much of our thoughts or else the incessant nature of them. I, I just found that quite shocking. <laughs> Pun. Um, it says so much of, about the power of our thoughts and, and our ability, you know, the, how untrained untrained our minds are uh, they did find the, the, which was interesting that people who are more agreeable or cooperative were more likely to enjoy being with themselves <laughs> so I thought that was an interesting point you know that points to the whole path of the middle way that we're practicing here that you know when we're more compassionate and kind and have a that kind of intention that it's a little bit easier to be with ourselves <laughs> that's interesting yeah so that that just says so much that many people would rather be electrically shocked than left alone with our thoughts um, and so 
the ability to practice in this, to develop the capacity and the skillfulness, the training that meditation develops cultivates the ability to see thoughts for what they are, awareness that can watch thoughts and not be so identified with them, not be so uh, so much suffering in just being with thought. We, um, so this is part of the training. Um, thoughts, of course, are not the enemy, are not the problem. It's the identification with them, the clinging, the sense of selfing with the thoughts that uh, creates the suffering. Um, the deeper, this is Guy Armstrong again, the deeper purpose of meditation is not simply to enjoy moments of calm, as rewarding and meaningful as they are, but to understand deeply how our mind leads us into unhappiness so that we can stop the activities that lead to those states. I'll read that again. The deeper purpose of meditation, not simply to enjoy moments of calm, although they are rewarding and meaningful. The deeper purpose is to understand deeply how our mind leads us into unhappiness so that we can stop the activities that lead to those states. <clears throat> and uh, this is not what I would call a beginner meditation, mindfulness of mind or mindfulness of thoughts and thinking. It's not where a beginner would normally begin. That being said, it's fine to try, you know, to not, not to expect to like uh, get it because that's just another form of clinging. But just to be curious and experiment and practice and start to cultivate, what's it like to cultivate awareness that can watch thinking and not just be it's so identified with the thinking. Um, imagery is helpful for me so often. And uh, I don't know the source of this image, uh, but um, I often think of like a mouse in a maze. And the mouse is scurrying around all day long looking for the exit, looking for the treats, looking for where did I leave that? Where am I supposed to go next? You know, that's what it feels like many days, just running around, don't forget that and do this and oh, where's the, where's the cheese? And uh, we get so identified with being in that maze and awareness is like the, the, the the watcher above the maze that is just watching the mouse run around and we can cultivate that sense of just seeing a oh, planning mind without being in it identified with it continuing to fuel it and feed it we can just watch ah oh, there's hmm Um, fearful mind, you know, oh, there's regretful mind, you know, just start to watch and name some of the grooves or it's, and sometimes, usually on a retreat when there's a bit more stability or calm, sometimes can even be felt just as a sensation almost that a thought bubble you don't even really know what the thought is necessarily 
but there's just oh there's a thought arising and it kind of just floats through or pops before you even um are attached to it so it's you know we don't we don't need to analyze it or add more thinking to the thinking <laughs> but just uh kind of cultivating that sense of awareness that can just name oh thinking is happening and this is really liberating yeah so let's try it <laughs> so um we'll we'll kind of uh get to that part we're going to start just by developing an anchor and some calm and stability um with either the breath or or another anchor of sound or a sensation whatever suits your practice best tonight and then we'll spend a little bit of time not a lot of time watching seeing cultivating the ability to watch thoughts all right so adjust your space your body your lighting to support your practice You might practice laying down, you might need a cushion, you might want to dim your lights. You could practice standing. Hmm. Finding a place where there's enough comfort and energy as well that and support that you can invite some stillness. You can either close the eyes or rest the eyes downward. And really allowing some spaciousness and time and attention to just settle so we're not trying to move quickly to an anchor but just landing into the moment Take some time to see if there's any tension that would be helpful to give some space or ease to. You might check out the muscles of the face and any habit tensions that are there for you in the forehead, the eyes, the jaw. Taking your time to invite ease into the face, letting go of outward expression and tension. And then let that feel as if it's flowing down through and across the neck and shoulders, letting these muscles soften, lengthen. bones of the shoulders nice and heavy but still feeling a sense of uprightness it's 
Awareness flowing down arms into relaxed hands. Fingers. We'll take some time to feel into the area of the torso, the back body, the heart center, belly center. Seeing what's needed here, some spaciousness or softness. I tend to practice quite a bit with soft belly, just over and over reminding the inner layers of the belly that it's okay to soften. So as the upper body begins to settle, we may feel more weightedness gravity presence through the hips and legs and feet. And then we'll begin to cultivate an, an anchor. So you could choose the breath as an anchor, mindfulness of breath, or something other than breath could be feeling the sensation of the hands or opening to hearing meditation. So see what anchor feels most supportive for you tonight. And with that anchor, cultivate some some sense of intention to be present with the whole length of the breath or the continuity of changing sensations in the hands or the continuous rising and falling of sounds, whichever anchor you've chosen. Just choose one now. And we'll notice that at times attention moves away to other thoughts or objects or other sensations arising. At some point, we notice that attention is not on the anchor we chose and we begin again. So it's not about forcing attention to stay, but about beginning again.
without judgment, beginning again. And depending on the conditions of your day and your energy and world circumstances, all the variables that affect us, uh, you might choose to just stay with your anchor and just continue returning to that anchor. And it's possible that if there has been some mindfulness established, some presence, some calm, then you could try for just a few period moments at a time to let go of your anchor, whether it's breath or sound or sensation, and then simply wait attentively. And see if you can notice the first thought that comes. You might also notice when the thought ends. It has an arising and an ending. And sometimes we can be mindful all the way through one thought. If you notice the ending of a thought, you can return to your anchor. So let's all come back to an anchor and we'll, we'll just try it a few more times. So we're with our breath or hands or sound, whatever anchor you chose, and just rest there again. Turn up the curiosity. When attention moves away from the anchor, just gently bring it back and begin again. And then as there's some, perhaps some degree of stability, you can let go of the anchor again. See if you can notice two thoughts in a row while remaining mindful, just observing, thinking, happening. So 
the beginning and end of a thought and maybe another one and then return to your anchor and rest. And then we'll let go of the anchor again and just open, simply waiting attentively. We'll do this for a few, a few seconds now, just watching thoughts arise and pass. And then return to your anchor, rest. And you can either just continue resting with your anchor, returning to the anchor, or we'll do another practice here, building up gradually our capacity to be mindful of thoughts without becoming lost in their content. And we'll do it for one minute now. Just open, waiting, watching, arising, passing thoughts. Let that go. 
And return to the breath or your anchor that you've chosen. And then we'll just stay there for the next few minutes. And as you rest with your anchor, there may be some cultivated awareness of when thoughts start to pull the awareness from the anchor. And that can just be known as thinking is happening, thinking is arising, and it's passing. And you rest with the anchor. So we maybe get not pulled as far into the stream of thought. Thank you for that experiment in thought and cultivation of capacity to begin to, uh, to see the projection, to see the movie, to see the, the constant creation that's happening. Um, there's a 
lovely teaching called the Honeyball Sutta. And it's a teaching of, um, about, it starts with what we've been exploring in this last series of these five aggregates. And um, so I won't, go, it could be another whole talk, so I won't go into it. Maybe I'll do that next time. Um, would probably be better too, so maybe I will just so that it makes more sense. But uh, since I've referenced it, I'll just point out that once we get to the the part of these formations of the mental formations where we have the stories around whatever the contact has been through our sense doors. Um, the Buddha said this way, um, what one thinks about, one will mentally proliferate about. That means it'll just keep growing and fermenting and being fueled. And then it goes on, with what one has mo mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions tinged by mental prol proliferations beset one, to beset, beset, B E S E T upon, with respect to past and future. So at this point, there's a turn that happens where, you know, it's not just like, oh, this is this automatic system that's happening, but we become beset by these thoughts, the mental proliferation, and Guy Armstrong describes it like this. Here's the kicker. We may have thought that our habit of turning perceptions into thoughts was kind of an innocent pastime, but now the bill comes due. Other perceptions and thoughts now beset us quite apart from our wishes or intentions. This is what happens at four in the morning. Who has not experienced this? We start out thinking about a small incident with our partner or anybody, and before long, a blizzard of thoughts has come storming in about past and future, arguments, regrets, plans, hurts, disappointments, therapy sessions, divorce, child custody, and so on. I watch, I watch this happening, I find it so amusing. Some little thing that's an annoyance, or you know, um, and how quickly my mind can go all the way to like divorce. Like, just because I'm annoyed about something. It's incredible, and, and, and it can be just kind of amusing to just watch, like, oh wow. There's those, there's that little blizzard of thought and not, I don't have to believe it. I don't have to feel shame about it. I don't have to take it on as true. Um, yeah, we find to our horror that we can't stop the thoughts and the accompanying flood of emotions does not dry up quickly. We're spinning in a stew of our own making to a greater or lesser extent, this is our condition much of the time when our attention is not clearly focused. And the more you practice with this mindfulness of mind or mindfulness of thoughts, mindfulness of thinking and thoughts, check out who the central character is all the time. It's you. <laughs> You're always the main character, even when it's a thought about somebody else. It's how you want them to be. <laughs> it, we're always, it's always me. And it gets pretty, not only irritating, but boring. It's like, oh my goodness, honey, honey. <laughs> Just, it's, it's amusing and also like, <sighs> exhausting but but curious and and like well, you don't have to work so hard to keep creating a self you know just watch it happen and 
we don't have to believe it. We don't have to believe the stories so much. I remember asking my one of my teachers, you know, when does when does this end? When do you get a break from this incessant eye making, this incessant meing? Um, and he said something like, when you're really sick of it. <laughs> yes. But also it's just this automatic system like we we do, we can't stop the five aggregates they just it's just the way the system happens so quickly but we can see through it we can cultivate the awareness that can just watch ah oh, sweetheart <laughs> you're hooked again don't bite the hook um yeah uh so if you found like that was impossible to do like how can I watch thinking? I was just like, oh, I'm thinking of that. I can't get any space from the thinking to be aware of thinking. You are already doing it. It's like, because if there's any sense of being able to say to someone in the next moment, oh, I was just thinking about being in Florida or whatever, or you know, what's for dinner, there's awareness of thinking. And so this can be cultivated and developed and we can start to have the awareness as it's happening without being uh, sucked on under the torrent. Yeah, it's definitely a practice. So have fun with it. <laughs> yeah so for folks that have joined us on the, the youtube recording thanks for uh checking that out i'll put the link to guy's book there and um i'll pr i'll put the link to regarding that uh study as well which i find so awesome as reported in the science magazine on um how people would rather opt into the electrical shock then be alone with their thoughts <laughs> so you did well hopefully none of you shocked yourselves in in that i think it was like a 22 minute practice or a little bit more maybe uh so good job you did longer than they did in the study <laughs> um yeah thanks for being here <laughs>